Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to Model 4 of the course Gender Mainstreaming and Artisanal Small Scale Mining. And that Model 4 will be looking at advocacy and campaigning for women inclusion in AASM. In the previous models, we have gone through the impact of ASM and how it disproportionately affects women, just like any other extractive um, activity. Albeit under ASM, the challenges are exacerbated due to the informal nature and um, the illegalities that uh, come with the ASM um, operations. However, it's worth mentioning that ASM is not all that bad. It is a major source of livelihoods for a huge section of the population in resource dependent countries, in particular indigenous businesses and mining impacted communities. Because in most countries, ASM activities by law are reserved for indigenous businesses. Thus, it forms the critical part of national development and relatively the highest employer of women uh, compared to large scale uh, mining. However, gender inequalities challenges um, persist despite employing a um, significant proportion of um, women because these women only work at the periphery and generally excluded from high value or rewarding activities. And more importantly, are excluded from the decision making um, process. But then um, this calls for increased advocacy for us as advocates to bridge the inequality gaps, leveraging on the existing protocols that we have gone through um, um, under Model 3, because um, undoubtedly the issue of gender is at the fore globally, regionally, um, within the sub-region, and even within our local context. But the point is, um, what do we um, advocate for? That's following the existing gender inequality gaps and women's peculiar needs and challenges, as we have highlighted in the uh, previous models. Um, the ensuing slides are a number of advocacy issues um, that we would want to go through, especially for state and non-state actors, gender advocates, feminist civil societies to push for um, to advance women's rights and empowerment for increased participation in the artisanal small scale uh, mining. So number one is um, asking for gender uh, impact assessment. We went through that um, under uh, model two, yes. And um, as a first point of call in dealing with gender inequalities and women challenges, in is, is undertaking um, gender impact assessment because this will enable us to ascertain the different needs of both men and women and the, the existing peculiar challenges that impede women from participating fully in the artisanal small scale mining. So from model two, we learned this can be done as the gender impact assessment can be done um, through three main um, approaches. Um, just as a way of highlight, um, it can either be integrated um, into the environmental and social impact assessment, or it can also be integrated as part of the human rights um, impact assessment, or the first track strategy is it can be done as a standalone assessment on its own. That's um, prior to, but it is it's important to know that um, if it's being done as a standalone um, um, 
um, intervention, um, there's the need for a baseline um, assessment because um, the, the gender impact assessment on its own can be conducted at any point in time within the mind life cycle. And for effective results, it's important to have a baseline so that we're able to compare and contrast how the mining operations have um, impacted um, both men and women um, differently. All right, so the second thing to also ask for as advocates is um, greater participation of women. So after having um, gender impact assessment, that's um, it, the gender impact assessment, just like an environmental impact assessment, or just like a social impact assessment or human rights impact assessment, what we are saying is that we should begin to build an advocacy uh, message that will equally make the issue of gender impact assessment binding on um, mining companies so that prior to the commencement of your mining activity, a gender impact assessment must be um, conducted so that right from the word go, we know the existing women challenges that impede their participation in the mining operation so that stakeholders will be informed accordingly on how to address such challenges to ensure that the mining activity will not exacerbate the challenge, but will rather uphold women's rights and encourage their participation. All right, so the second ask is greater participation of women. And how do we ensure that? Fortunately, the Intergovernmental Forum IGF has a number of, or proposed a number of approaches or strategies that we can, through which we can um, push for greater participation of women in the extractive sector. Number one is, going through or advocating for increased access to land, licenses, and legal protection. If you recall from model one, one key challenge that um, impede women from participating effectively in mining operations is, their, is the restriction or their, the restriction to their access to land, not just access to land, but land ownership. So because of this, it prevents them from having access to um, mineable concessions, especially under the ASM um, sector. Um, it also prevents them from um, having benefit in, in, in terms of um, compensation um, packages um, that uh, um, go on prior to the commencement of uh, mining activities, because usually compensation packages will engage uh, owners of the land resources, be it residential or be it farmlands, but women may be dependent on these lands. However, they are not the owners, so they are excluded from the entire um, from the entire process. So key is access to land. And this is also critical because land um, is also a form of um, collateral property. So solving the problem of access to land will not only um, ensure that women have access to mineable concessions, um, especially under the ASM um, sector, access to mi uh, mineable concessions. However, it will also ensure that women have um, collateral property such that if they do not even want to mine their own on their own land, but they want to participate along the value chain, the, 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 the land will grant them access or facilitate their access to loanable funds or to a credit facility to give them that requisite capital to participate in any um, 
point within the value chain of the mining activity. It is also important that um, specific uh, incentives are created, which not just a one time something, but is actually institutionalized, a legal incentive to enhance women um, access to licenses. It can be um, provision of capacity development programs to enlighten women on the licensing um, process procedures, the fees and charges, where to go through, where to go to, and all that to to expose them to the process and and how easy uh, or how difficult and how they will be able to maneuver their way through to assess um, mining license and uh, manual rights to to mine or participate effectively within the process. Another um, um, approach that the IGF proposes to deepen women participation in mining is through, uh, is facilitating their access to finance. I mentioned um, one under um, the land ownership, access to land, that's um, by giving them access to land, you grant them access to collateral property to be, to be able to facilitate um, their access to loanable funds, to be able to have the requisite um, capital to participate along the value chain. Another way to facilitate um, women access to finance is the establishment of state managed um, loans uh, facilities that um, government is also coming, um, coming through to establish um, something for women, the microfinance or um, a rural banking tailored for women. Um, another area to that um, can be looked at in terms of facilitating access to finance is, is um, the government, um, 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 how government can collaborate with existing banks to introduce gender perspective within the banking sector, such that um, the process of accessing um, loanable funds or the process of accessing credit will be a lot more easier for women. And uh, maybe the requirement can, can, can be um, lessened in terms of um, providing access, um, in terms of um, having women in mind and um, creating a source of incentives um, to incentivize their participation or to incentivize them to go to the bank to access um, loanable funds or credit, making it easy for them. Another way is access to information, geological data and networks. Information is very key. And um, one way that we can encourage or empower women to participate effectively in the extractive industry is by facilitating their access to information that's creating some form of public awareness and um, the provision of um, information, as much information as possible concerning the process, whether it's license, whether it's geological information on which, where um, we have um, um, mineable lands, um, which communities or which specific areas um, have as much mineral resources as possible to inform women participation in the sector because information is key. You need to even know where to start the registration from. How do you start, where to go, which um, sector agency, government sector agency is responsible and which um, kind of information or even tools and equipment technology that you need in order to, uh, to inform your thoughts, even if you have um, credit or you have the capital, there's requisite market information. If you find the minerals, where do you sell the minerals? At what prevailing prices? All these are very key to encourage women participation because sometimes you may have the funds, you may have the capital, but you do not have the requisite in information to participate um, effectively, so that women can participate the uh, in the core mining activity themselves, but not just um, having uh, men front it for them or having men 
lead the way for them because they are not aware of the requisite um, information. So have access to institutional support and services. So where um, government agencies or development partners will provide the requisite um, 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 technical support to aid women's participation. Access to equipment and technology, I've mentioned it in, in the previous um, slide. So these are the two main um, 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 campaign asks or advocacy issues that we can build from scratch to promote women participation in the extractive sector. That's one, making gender impact assessment a legal binding um, intervention, just like um, environmental uh, and social impact assessment or human rights impact assessment. And two, um, promoting greater participation of women through um, the various approaches that um, IGF proposed we went through. But there are other, um, um, other um, campaign issues or other advocacy cases that we can build in addition to this to promote women participation in the extractive um, sector. So we have the FPIC, that's the free, prior, and informed consent. Usually, um, this is supposed to be uh, prior to the commencement of um, um, prior to the commencement of uh, mining activity, the FPIC is critical. But what happens is that due to the patriarchal nature of our communities, where men are the head of the family or the head of um, the heads of um, households, so automatically they are the decision makers. And we have our traditional authorities, landowners, all be men. Although the ethnic process go on, at the end of the day, the the the, the process is um, not gender um, um, sensitive because of how the process is done and the people who are um, involved are chosen. It becomes more of men consulting the men through the process, other than having a more gender diverse. Um, consultative process. So some of the things that we can also look at is that we should call for a more gender representation um, consultative process with the free power and informed consent. That's the situation. If you are calling um, landowners, you want to engage landowners because you require um, um, land for your mining activity as much as possible, we should ensure that the women dependents of those lands are also consulted in the process. From model one, we understood that although women may not be the land owners of the land resources, usually they are the ones who cultivate those resources and they are dependent on those lands for their livelihoods, and also for food security. Therefore, it's important that within the ethic process, such women who are dependent on the land are also involved and consulted. Again, community consultation, just like the ethic, should also not be reduced to just opinion leaders who based on the, 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 the societal fiber are men but conscious efforts should be made to consult women groups. That women, we should encourage the formation of women groups in these mining impacted communities. So that during community consultations, at least the leadership of these women groups will be meaningfully engaged so that they will be able to properly articulate the peculiar needs of women and how these mining um, activities can impact the lives of these community women um, differently and come up with um, appropriate mechanisms to alleviate or mitigate against um, these um, 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 harsh impact of the mining activities. We've already mentioned the impact assessment. 
So also critical again is that is the stand alone um, gender impact assessment. The main thing is that it, should, it shouldn't just be taking the box. We should ensure that it is legalized and that any mining company prior to the commencement of your mining operation, you know that by law, you are required to undertake um, this impact assessment and it should be um, have gender um, sensitive mechanisms so that we'll be able to ascertain the peculiar uh, or differentiated needs of men, women, girls, and boys. Also key to note or to ask for is the compensation and land and territory rights. As I've already mentioned at length, the issue of land is a big challenge when it comes to our, um, um, when it comes to our part of the world. Because of the land tenure system, ownership to land is, is, is problematic within the rural, rural communities. Unfortunately, the compensation process is reduced to the, to the land ownership and not dependent. But what's of importance is that the compensation process should not just be reduced to cash compensation. Because once it's cash and it's given to the landowner, it means that all other dependents are excluded and all other dependents who will lose their livelihoods, who will lose their source of feeding the, uh, their families, uh, their lives will be left impoverished because of the uh, advent of the mining um, operation. But that shouldn't be so. The presence of the uh, mining activity should uphold the lives the, um, the living condition, the rights and the living conditions of the indigenous, the community within which the mining activity is taking place and should not make their lives worse off. That's why we are calling that as much as possible compensation should even include land, land for land compensation so that we will be able to continue or sustain continue or sustain um, um, livelihoods as well as sustain um, um, full security for those who previously depended on the land that has been taken over for mining activity. So all those or should also, the, the compensation process should also consider um, such, su such ask so that at the end of the day, mining activities who make the lives of indigents better, particularly women who do not have ownership um, of land um, resources. Participation in the workforce. We have already talked about um, increased participation. That's having, um, having um, national policies or having um, gender specific uh, uh, sector specific gender policy such that mining companies will be bound by such laws and will be compelled to internalize those laws in their respective organizational um, um, framework so that um, 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 it will not be a matter of volution by the company just to say I have um, this number of women as a matter of just taking the box. It's not just about having a quota system and saying that I have this percentage of my workforce being women, but it is important to ensure that such women are participating at the core mining activity and that the requisite, the, the, there's the requisite provision being made to make their lives um, comfortable, such, that, so, such as um, 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 nursery, or care um, facilities for women who have children, or there's um, job security for uh, pregnant women who go on maternity, so that women will not be afraid that um, when I get pregnant, I may lose my job, 
or when I have children because of the uh, parental need required of me as a mother, I will not have time to work in the mining sector or to do a core mining job because I'm, 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 I'm a mother. Being a mother or being pregnant should not be a challenge that should impede or undermine the participation of women in the extractive industry. Local procurement. Again, um, there should be um, 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 the participation of women along the value chain. That's most times when we talk about increasing the participation of women in extractives, a lot of attention goes quickly to employment. But it's, it's important to know that um, the value chain, that's procurement, that's where really sometimes you have um, a lot of um, high rewarding jobs. That's the contracts, the subcontracting and all the, the goods and service provision and not just within the employment. So we, we should ask for greater participation along the value chain. There should be some level of incentives for um, women-owned businesses to participate within the value chain. We should not, one thing we, we, we are quick to do is that we reserve, as, as just like um, at the mining site, we reserve the low hanging ones for the women like catering, cleaning and what have you. But there should be um, greater advocacy message to have women owned businesses participating in other core jobs, uh, technical jobs that are high rewarding, uh, that have high income um, value. So th th there should be um, some incentives Maybe during the bidding process, um, there can be some um, 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 incentive for women to participate um, within easily in the bidding process and be providing technical support services for women-owned um, business in terms of maybe um, um, drafting of a proposal, drafting of a proposal to bid for a contract or even provision of um, um, vocational support services for women to enhance their skills and empower them to uh, acquire the requisite skills and participate in the technical aspect within the mining value chain. Political participation has always been an issue generally. Away from resource governance, when you come to our part of the world, we have we realized that right from parliament to local governance and what have we the participation of women have been quite low. But this cause did this cause for um, um, a greater uh, or and a more intensified um, advocacy as from advocates and um, feminists and all other stakeholders to to encourage women participation at the decision-making level so that we will not just say that we have this number of women at the, in, in our companies, in the mining company, we have this number of women um, within the value chain or um, for one company to say that I have this percentage of women participating um, 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 in terms of procurement, but then they should be at the decision-making level. The women participating in the extractive sector should not be at the low hanging fruits, maybe just at the administrative level, but how many of these women are at the senior or at the management or at the board level where they participate effectively in decision-making um, of the company or in, even at the central government level, how many women are in the resource sector, maybe in the Ministry of Mines or in Ministry of Petroleum, how many women sit at the level where they are part of effective decision making or how many women in terms of um, sector agencies are part of the board 
level or CEO level um, to contribute to critical decisions um, concerning the resource sector. All right, so one other era that is critical is women's sexual and reproductive health. In model one, we mentioned that um, the presence of mining operations in a community leads to the proliferation of um, uh, migrants from um, surrounding towns and even from urban sectors. Usually this leads also to the increased incidence of um, social vices and mainly sexual abuse and what have you. And at the center of this are uh, women. Therefore, there's the need to um, intensify advocacy for the protection of women in these uh, mining impacted communities in terms of um, creating, uh, making information available concerning their sexual health, um, how they can protect themselves and um, not be left vulnerable to um, um, perpetrators. We also have um, um, how we can encourage women to be more assertive to um, report gender-based violence and also protect themselves against um, all forms of um, um, human trafficking. It is worth mentioning that um, there's the need for women to understand or have a well-established reporting mechanisms so that um, women will be able to report incidents of abuse um, in mining operations. Because once they are aware of where to go, once they are aware of uh, that perpetrators will be punished or those who are complicit will receive the appropriate punitive measures, they have confidence to be able to participate freely in, in, in extractive operations because um, perpetrators are also aware that the existing punitive measures will be adequately enforced if they at any point in time abuse or subject any uh, woman to any form of um, abuse. So this is more or less building trust, developing um, um, the judicial system to uh, build trust among women that um, they are well protected and their interest is upheld. All right, so access to justice and remedy. So that's what I talked about, that women are well protected and they are reassured that um, once they go to work at mine sites, their interests are, 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 are protected and that um, there's a well-established reporting mechanism to report incidents of abuse and discrimination. There's a well-established judicial system to um, ensure punitive measures on um, perpetrators of abuse. And this um, developed trust and women feel protected to engage in core mining activities to be at mine sites um, just as uh, men. We have a number of um, revenue allocation mechanisms um, to ensure that extractive revenues go to contribute to socioeconomic development. What is usually missing is that um, revenue allocation mechanisms or policies or acts that oversee um, the allocation and utilization of extractive revenues lack gender perspective. So the, there's no um, specific way of ensuring that um, um, the revenues or extractive revenues go to serve or encourage more um, women um, participation or encourage more women um, address or um, women needs. But it's, um, it's just there if you're a woman and you want to access uh, government specific interventions that have been financed by extractive re revenue, that's fine. But if you are not aware of it, then it passes you by. As advocates, it's important that we advocate for uh, gender 
sensitive mechanisms in revenue allocation and revenue utilization, so that it can even be a fund. Some of some extractive revenues are dedicated to supporting women um, empowerment programs, or even it can even be supporting girls in STEM education. Girls in mining impacted communities are supported with um, a quota of um, extractive revenues to um, build their capacity in STEM education such that um, years later, they will have the requisite competencies to participate in the extractive sector. Because many times the complaint is that, oh, many times the excuse is that, um, yes, what if, um, yes, we advertise, we want a woman, but the, there are limited women with the required technical competency to participate in the mining industry. So revenue allocation that has gender budgeting or gender responsive budgeting is a way that we can promote more and more um, girls in STEM education and, and empower them that years later, um, women or girls from mining impacted communities will be able to participate but directly in the mining industry, um, such that the benefit will not just um, accrue to a certain category of women, that's elites or women from urban centers, leaving behind women in mining impacted communities who bear directly the impact, the harsh impact of mining activities. Talking about revenue allocation, all efforts, it's important that all efforts are geared towards plugging in revenue leakages, avenues for revenue leakages. Therefore, the need for tax justice, that's all forms of illicit financial flows are eliminated. All forms of tax evasion and avoidance are eliminated. So the maximum benefit can be accrued um, from extractive activities through taxes and we'll be able to support um, developmental programs and also um, ensure uh, inclusive socioeconomic development, have enough to dedicate for um, gender specific um, activity to address the peculiar needs of women and girls and empower them to participate fully in um, extractive um, activities. The gender relevant and gender disaggregated data. This is an area that the EITI is doing well. As I mentioned um, um, in model three, the EITI um, requirement 6.3, um, I think, um, requires countries to report gender disaggregated data. There's, if you are reporting that um, mining or ASM is employing this number of people. The question is how many of these are men? You should be able to break down the numbers to how many of these are men and how many of these are women. And this number of, if you have this number of women in the sector, what exactly do they do? How many of them are just at the periphery and how many of them are into coal mining activities? or how many of them are just into um, other administrative tasks? How many of them are at the decision-making level? And this is something that should not just be left at the EITI level, but should be um, mainstream or integrated into national laws and national policies. So that at the end of the day, to be easier to have the specific um, details in terms of um, gender diversity in the um, extractive sector to inform policy makers the, um, adequately to come up with um, sufficient or the appropriate policies to address um, gender gaps. So that brings us to the end of uh, model four, uh, the last model for um, this course. Um, it is very important that as advocates, we take this seriously. I'm happy that this is actually, um, the, the last model of this course is actually looking at 
advocacy and campaign as and how to build advocacy um, cases for gender equality and gender mainstreaming in the extractive sector. So as always, I will encourage you to bring your questions at the comments uh, at the discussion forum. And if you have um, any advo gender advocacy case that you are working on in your country, please, we will be happy you share with us um, what you are doing and how uh, stakeholders are also responding to it. We'll be happy to know the interventions and the approach that you've adopted. And if there have been any successes, we'll be happy to know. If, if there are any challenges, we'll be happy to know so that others can also learn from it. Um, thank you very much um, for being part of this course. And I want to encourage you to um, try and work on all the um, assessments under the various models and also the very final assessment so that you can qualify uh, for the um, certificate. So um, I wish you all the best and um, let's keep the discussion going in the discussion forum. Bye-bye.